Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1085th New Social Environment. I'm Magli, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Aaron Sheriff and Christina Yang. And now I'll introduce today's guests and hosts. Aaron Sheriff's diverse body of work, which includes photography, video, and sculpture, is united by her interests in the ways we experience three-dimensional forms in an age in which our perception is almost invariably met mediated by still and moving images. Her work explores the gap between objects and their representations in the materials and materiality of image making. The artist lives and works in Montreal. Christina Yang is an independent curator, writer, and scholar based in New York. She specializes in experimental genres, spectatorship, politics of the image, and feminist care. She's been a curator at the Kitchen, Queens and Guggenheim Museums, as well as the Williams College and UC Berkeley. She's a PhD candidate in performance studies at NYU. And now I will hand it over to Christina. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. It is an honor to be here with the Brooklyn Rail and with Aaron Sheriff. Um, it's just, yeah, it's such a tremendous pleasure to, to see everyone actually in the room. Uh, we're going to go quickly soon to look at some images. Well, actually, you know, Magli, if you wanted to just put the first um, opening uh, placeholder slide up. Um, so this conversation that we're going to have with Aaron Sheriff is on the occasion of um, her one-person show that just opened at the Sikkima Jenkins Gallery in New York City. And I certainly encourage you to go visit it. Um, and, or if you get a chance to see her other work, whoops, let's go, yeah, let's go to the top. Um, you guys got a little peek of, <laughs> peek of what's coming. Um, because, um, you know, in as much as Aaron's work does address uh, issues around media and reproduction and representation, there's really nothing like seeing it in person. And so we're gonna kind of move back and forth between that space. And um, just to say that this is an incredible opportunity to hear from the artist directly. Um, so, uh, and also I just wanted to encourage that, uh, that, we, that we're gonna begin slow and that, and maybe to stay slow, uh, really every detail and every um, view every decision that um, are, are in these images and in, in these works is actually uh, deeply intentional. And, and so I want us to dwell a little bit on that, uh, on that slowness and care uh, as, as we look at Aaron's work. So um, let's just go to the next slide as if we were walking into the gallery. Um, this exhibition uh, in at Sycamore Jenkins unfolds across four discrete spaces of different scale. And they include a comprehensive showing of Aaron's artistic concerns across sculpture, photography, and video, broadly speaking. Um, they, more specifically, uh, the work offers proposals around time, questions about object making, and a dialogue with the histories of art and technology. So I'd like to look at each um, a couple of the works individually um, as they represent certain series of works that uh, Aaron works on, but, um, and, and I'll probably try to approach it from three different angles. Uh, one will be to hear from Aaron herself about the making of the work and the questions that she's asking of it. And then the third um, area of question has more to do with how the work is performing in the world, how we might experience as spectators, you know, what, you know, it, it, I'm very much a believer that objects um, do something, you know, to 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 the viewer and to the space and and to to us. They activate a chain of um, lots of different ways of thinking. So that's a space that um, maybe you can start thinking about some questions, and that you know we'll get a chance to hear from the artists, um, you know, a little bit about. Uh, you know, aspirations, intentions, and maybe maybe objections. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so what we're looking at here as you walk into the gallery is actually two of the three works that are in the front space. We, we'll, we'll get to the third work that you don't see. You actually do have a view onto 
the large um, kind of drama, larger space in the gallery. But Erin, as I was um, looking at the images from this exhibition and from the previous one, it actually occurred to me that each gallery has three experiences built into it. And, I, and I'm kind of curious if you, um, if you, if you have any opening thoughts on, on staging this, this first gallery uh, before we go actually look at the, um, the titular piece, before we look at Sunset Palace and we talk a little bit about, you know, about the, the first piece itself. Um, I had a layout in mind when I came to do the installation, but then of course things change. I mean, the big sculpture had to be placed in advance. So that was really mapped out pretty specifically. Um, but, you know, I, I think a lot about how someone enters the space, what they say, see first, what they say, see second, if uh, there's space to allow someone to approach something and walk around it. Um, this piece on the left, the colorful piece is called Sunset Palace. It kind of made sense to have it in the entryway because the title of the show is named after it. Um, it uh, but then I didn't want it on the right because I didn't want to detract from the impression of the sculpture in the back. So I like that the first sculpture on your right, which we'll see maybe eventually is a little bit more um, restrained and uh, focused and not so exuberant. So little just, and then having the smaller sculpture sort of face away from you. So you had to walk around, go uh, approach it and walk around it. So those are, I sort of think about how a viewer enters into a space and how they, you know, how they bounce between the objects. Maybe that's why I hadn't thought about the um, three formula that you just talked about. I think that's a natural sort of odd number sort of dynamic maybe to create um, energy in a room. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so it, it happens. I, I, again, I come with a game plan, but then things change. And in some cases, because, you know, I'm sort of relatively new in Montreal and I still produce my work in New York, uh, sometimes I wasn't seeing the material framed until I was there on site. So mm -hmm. um, it's sort of responding, you know, in the last couple of weeks to seeing it and seeing what it actually felt like um, in person. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I love that there's a process of both planning and intuition. And then, you know, again, to just reiterate to our online viewers that uh, there is something magical that happens in the space of the work itself. And so, and those decisions are um, both, both, I think, you know, intentional and, um, I don't know, allowed to sort of like speak like in real time, in real space. Um, Magli, could we go to the first, the next image, which will, should be a uh, just a frontal image of Sunset Palace. Um, so, uh, um, Aaron, um, this is a, a new work, uh, that I think came to the gallery that the very, you know, week that you yeah, arrived. Day before, the, day before the opening. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and, and it's, um, it's a little uh, difficult to read the texture of it. So I'm wondering if you would like to maybe talk through it yourself as uh, you know, sure. uh, how you, how you want it to be, you know, read, um, and and then um, of course I'm super curious about the title and uh, the and if you think about titles especially since this is the title of the exhibition itself. Yeah, um, so this is sort of the newest iteration of a body of work that I started some years ago. I think 2018 was the first time I started making work like this. It, it comes through this interest I have, uh, sort of long-standing interest in what kind of experience we can have of three-dimensional objects that we only see. Um, in reproduction. Um, specifically for me, because I am older, um, uh, objects in books. Um, my relationship to books, to the printed page, is one that um, is very strong and one that I've had throughout my life as an artist. Um, and so I sort of became curious at some point about, you know, yes, the question of scale and the question of bodily, a bodily sort of interaction with objects is you know, immediately um, a question when you're looking at something as an at an image, but I was also sort of curious about what trace of the, you know, haptic texture, like materiality is translated through reproduction. And could you really get a sense of um, touch through image? So I started this body of work by really looking at pictures of, uh, you know, objects from, you know, the recent past, um, getting more and more distant uh, every day. But, um, and, and, and I started scanning these images and trying to get sort of like isolate these moments where 
the camera maybe picked up on a reflection and you can kind of read that it was wax versus lacquer, steel versus bronze. And of course, when you scan book reproductions, what you really get is a representation of the offset reproduction technology that's generating the images, the dot patterns, the moiré patterns. So that became sort of an interesting veil to try to access this information through. And it became sort of a compositional tool as well in, these early, in the early works, which were pre-monochrome. And then as the, as the series or the body of work, I suppose, progressed, um, I kind of changed focus and things got a little bit more complicated, things got a little bit more colorful. Um, I started treating the elements themselves within the what are essentially collages um, as sort of material to weave physically in within the frame as well. Um, so in this case, um, to get back to this particular work, um, it is a greatly enlarged uh, fragments of a Caro sculpture. Um, and also a Brancusi sculpture, and also a commercial photograph of um, a bloom, like a flower bloom. And I, I, you know, I quickly, when I started making these, this body of work, I was, you know, within the second sort of evolution of it, I would say, I became interested in creating uh, sort of ad hoc but composite forms within the collage, like using elements from different objects to create a sort of third object within the, the collage. And this is sort of a continuation of that, but I was trying to here um, interrelate the foreground, a traditional sense of foreground and background and have those things mm. intersect with one another through the layering. So it's hard to see. Um, if you haven't seen this work in person, um, I haven't been there this morning, this is the first day the show is open to public really. Um, they're quite deep frames, they're about six inches deep, and these are dye sublimation prints, and it's a process where um, images in this case are printed directly onto the aluminum, um, onto aluminum, I should say, and then I cut them, have them cut into these shapes, and then they are leaned within the frame against one another um, to create these sort of semi-informal compositions. Uh, by, by informal, by that I mean sort of, they're just leaning against one another. And in that arrangement though, they create this uh, form um, that I think has a sort of suggests a dimensionality of its own. Um, but if you were to see it on, if you were to really go up close to it, uh, you know, in this case, the brass would sort of dissolve into a series of, of dots of red and yellow and cyan and magenta. Um, sorry, cyan, yellow, uh, yellow, and uh, you know, whatever. I'm 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 losing my I'm losing my uh, my technical prowess in, in the moment, but no, that's so that's so wonderful to hear you. Um, actually give a close reading, but also your position it within the within the context of your, you know, larger uh, uh, artistic investigation into uh, image making, you know, technical reproduction. Um, uh, so we're, we're we're going to be able to see um, some details of, of other works that are similar to this. So so uh, hang, hang with us online. Um, and also, um, we're going to I want to return to this. Um, mentioned that you had about your interest in learning from books and then learning, you know, the history of art, history of sculpture, uh, and learning about um, objects through, 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 through the page. Um, but just one, one quick question, uh, the title, Sunset yeah. Palace, right. which, you know, again, you know, evocation of a site, but also evocation of like duration. And so just curious, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I missed that. Um, That's okay, yeah. I, oftentimes the titles of these works are sort of an amalgam of the titles of the works pictured in the collage. Hmm. Not all of the, the works, but I, you know, I consider the, the, the titles of the works and try to make some sort of uh, mishmash, I suppose, of uh, some titles uh, to create, you know, uh, something that has its own sort of title integrity, I, I guess. Um, in this case, uh, the work uh, that Caro, uh, that I'm of, that I'm picturing in the work is called Elephant Palace, and I. But the colors of the flower, which form the gradient, the yellow and orange and purple and blue, um, I was thinking a lot about uh, Dusk Form, which is the name of the large sculpture, and just thinking about this 
idea of sort of that the evening, the transition into evening from day, uh, that moment of transition being a time when things lose their definition, there's sort of percep perceptual ambiguity, things become less solid as this really sort of magical time and sort of emblematic of a lot of things that I'm interested in in the studio. And so, and it's also this sort of indulgent, luxurious sort of like um, uh, suggestion as well with Palace. I like the idea of, um, I, I just thought it was evocative. For, uh, that's why I chose it as the title for the show. Um, so it, it was sort of a response to the color. Um, it was my own response to the color palette of this particular work. Um, but then it seemed fitting for the ex exhibition itself. You know, beautiful. I think it, it actually does all of those things. And um, I didn't know that there was a reference to, uh, and I'm going to say the name of the artist that you've been referring to, to Anthony Caro's work. So a British modernist sculptor, um, you know, recognized uh, for his work in abstraction and also with uh, industrial materials. Um, and also as a student of Henry Moore, another uh, sculptor that, um, that you reference in your work. Um, so let, let's go to the next um, image. Uh, and uh, so, so the next two images, this one and then one following are not in the exhibition, but they are from a you know somewhat recent series of work that Aaron has done um, that has been exhibited uh, in different museums and galleries. And they're fairly large scale, although they, you know, they reference kind of like handheld books or monographic um, things that, that you would carry around. And, uh, you know, a particular uh, kind of technique that is at play is this a uh, fold in the middle. Um, but Aaron, again, maybe you could talk us through this, like, like the subject and then the, the thinking about, um, uh, I guess I'm particularly interested in um, this other object, this, as you, you, you talk about like a third thing between sculpture and photography, and then maybe perhaps also then bringing in books and then how we learn about the histories of art. Yeah, I mean, listen, when, you know, I, I've said this before many times when I talk to students, um, when I've had the opportunity to teach, and they have these sort of fully formed ideas about, uh, or they seem to, about, you know, art movements um, and artists, and you realize that oftentimes this is all information that's come from the internet or from books. It's not, you know, first person grappling with the work itself. Um, and you sort of wonder like, well, what is that? Ex what is that experience? I find it, of course, you know, everybody, you know, you have to see the real thing. You have to see the real thing, which of course is important, but there's this other experience that can happen that I find, you know, again, something I've said probably too many times, but I find it very generative to look at images of work in which you don't have all the information. There's a lot of sort of mystery and, um, you know, the remoteness of the object sort of creates this space that allows you to project onto it that I find um, quite uh, compelling, I guess. Um, this particular body of work is a strategy of, of splicing two halves together to make a third object here. These are objects that in this particular series I made out of uh, hydrostone, which is a hard plaster. They're tabletop scale, maybe 16 inches tall max. And I photograph them on the seamless paper so that the scale of the objects is left um, sort of unknowable. You, you kind of get a sense of it, but it could also be larger or smaller than you think. Um, and then, you know, create these composite forms by connecting them at the centerfold. And that, you know, in this, for me, the most sort of operative dynamic or experience of it, uh, the one that I think is the most meaningful for me in hindsight, not something I really intended to create. I'm not an artist that really has a, a uh, you know, I'm not trying to illustrate a point that I'm, I'm trying to, I have in mind, but um, I love that you look at an object like this depicted in the photo um, and you are accepting it as a whole. And yet, as part of that inherent to that acceptance is understanding that you're getting two halves, that there's all of this, like baked into it is a sense of incompletion of the two halves, um, that there's all this sort of unknowability to it. Um, so that's, um, this series is called FIG, which is named after, you know, the convention and books for illustrations. And um, like you said, they're quite large and they are either 
framed sort of in this orientation where they sort of fold out like an open book or in the reverse sort of like a tent, um, like a, a book on its um, on its uh, laying face down. And I guess the conceit is that it's sort of a detached signature from a book that's been framed. So, you know, if you were to print a book, you would print page 13 next to page 72, and then it would be bound and it would be, once it was a complete book, it would be continuous. But this is as if they were sort of separated at the spine. Incredible. I hope uh, people can see online. Uh, there's there's a there's these slight like um, undulations uh, where where the the page is actually lifted up from how it's photographed. You can see the shadow underneath it. So that is actually literally um, the space underneath it. And as Aaron mentioned, the fold that created like when you have a signature in in a printed catalog. Um, we can look at the next image too, just to um, have a comparison. You can see sort of like how magically um, you know this simple kind of um in a way it's a transference of transference of a of a, of a of a of a printing technique you know into made into an art form also aaron i just wanted to mention that your um you know your uh, uh kind of uh constant or, or crystallization of this idea of putting two fragments together is so compelling because there's you know a political Political theory around the fragment that the fragment is because it's it is incomplete and it everything it touches is precarious and so in that way it is a sort of uh, like a resistance to totalitarianism so it's mm -hmm. it actually is a kind of like a uh, beautiful visual and material display of what happens when you know when there's a kind of unknowingness going on and when there's an mm -hmm. incompleteness and so I I just realize that and hearing you talk about um, mm. your interest in putting together fragments. And so I, I just, you know, wanted to put that out there. Um, yeah. uh, so, but, you know, but let's, let's maybe continue this uh, conversation around pieces and around layering to this next piece. Um, Magali, we go to the next piece, uh, paper sculpture. So this is uh, an, another incredible large scale framed work that is in the main space at Sycamore Jenkins. Um, and in some ways it brings together the previous two, uh, like, you know, the, the a, a similar kind of layering process and scanning process that uh, Aaron spoke about in Sunset Palace, but then also, um, you know, this, this uh, idea of um, a visual experience is also a tactile experience. So I'm, I'm really taken with this notion of visuality as touch and of like the haptics of of looking, um, and I, I, again, I'm I'm also just uh, so both moved and um, stunned that the work is called paper sculpture, and yet to find the paper is actually you know a kind of tension of like you know where is the paper actually in this in this sculpture work that is that are these layers of metal, uh, I mean aluminum, and then the, the you know that have been uh, where the print has been transferred onto the surface, um, but. Please walk us through this piece and, and uh, you know, what some of the things that we think we're looking at, but maybe, are, and what are we looking at, actually, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> your perspective. I guess this, this particular work, I, I was curious about creating um, a composition that was more sort of vertical, linear layers and having things intersect sort of horizontally, but having it be a very sort of linear vertical composition. Um, that sounds very um, formal, um, but that was sort of something I, you know, I had done uh, compositions that were very about, you know, a thing, an object, a central sort of form within the comp uh, within the collage, and I wanted a bit more of an all over um, composition, but again, to have this sort of weaving or uh, layering happening, uh, and the the, the white uh, cut, the cut on the piece on the left that you see that creates that sort of page-like white shape, um, I wanted to include to sort of like speak to the origins. All of these things are scans from books. Um, and they, and you're right, I mean, there's plaster, there's stone, there's wood, there's painted metal. Um, and I was sort of curious how those things would retain their materiality in this, you know, format. You have an image, I think, coming up that shows a detail of the layering. Is you can that... go to the next one. Yep. Yep. 
Here we yeah, go. So at the very bottom, yep. You can see in this, like, you know, it looks luscious or, or you know, very material, materially present from a distance. But then when you go closer, it really sort of dissolves into this resol this question of resolution, I think. And um, and those are that's an indication of how the pieces just sort of sit in these vitrine like uh, frames. Um, yeah, I mean, I I go through the process for these works is very much I have a, a sort of ridiculous uh, library of torn up, cut up art books that I get from various used bookstores. <laughs> um, I used to be really precious about them, but now I just exacto the, the pages out of them. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's I guess a, a truism, maybe every, uh, everybody knows this, but like you can have a really incredible object that doesn't photograph well and vice versa. Um, in a way, I think my work is a, I, I mean, I have at this point some favorite photographers um, more so than interesting. favorite artists. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, uh, in this case, um, I was just really taken with the materiality of the object. And, and wanted to see them together. Um, and I, I mean, I, I'll go through the books, I'll take iPhones, sort of snapshots of things that are interesting to me. And then um, the compositions come together over an exceptionally long period of time in my studio, just sort of me noodling on the screen. Uh, and things, I mean, there's another work in the show that has been in the drafts folder on my computer for probably four years. So they just sort of like, I just sort of move things around and um, and then it gets to a point of becoming more convincing, I guess, and having a bit more integrity itself as an image. Um, and then, as I say, I produce in, with this amazing printer in um, Sunset Park in Brooklyn. So I create these digital compositions on the computer. I map out the layering, I sort of, design the frame, uh, you know, in terms of like how things have to be positioned. And I create, actually, these are the cardboard sort of mock-ups for mm -hmm. each shape that I do to scale in my studio. Um, and then I go down to New York and we work out the color um, together and then um, the framer sort of executes. They do the magic that um, they always do at Downing Frames. So it's this multi-step process, but that first process of the composition that goes from the iPhone photo to the high-res scan is the thing that um, takes up most of the time, of course. Um, and it's something that, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I'll be staring at something for six months and then I'll just reverse it and it just starts working. Um, it's just one of those, that's just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what well, yeah, Everybody goes to this in the studio. That's but that's my process. It goes a little bit between you know analog and digital processes, I guess. It's it's just so fascinating to hear you speak about that um, that magic that that your that your, your your process of play and your process of like letting it go. And it's almost it seems like it's an improvisational, but at the same time, it's you know controlled controlled by what you trust um, and and how you're working, how, how your eye is working, and your and your mind is working. And I. I want you to, you know, sort of like feel convinced that when you're in front of the work, you actually feel all of those decisions. I can, I can feel the sort of like layering of digital process and, you know, acquiring. But then as I actually think about it, it's like, I know that there has to be a hand that actually like put them all together somehow. And, and that to hear that it's multiple hands is amazing. And, uh -huh. um, uh, and, and, uh, but because it kind of like both, like, I mean, I'm looking at it, I'm trying to figure it out on my own, but then to hear you just say it, I think, I hope the audience r recognizes, you know, how you're kind of like pulling the veil off of like art making here, but, it, but it's all there actually. It's, it's actually the, the touch is all there. I mean, I, I go back and forth from my computer. I think probably, I mean, I don't know. I, I I'm sure most people have an analog digital practice at this point. To me, it's so second nature. Um, sometimes I'll be cutting something in my studio and I'll do something wrong in my mind. I'll like mentally do like control X, like, or like, like control, like sort of try to reverse it, like try to undo it, control Z. Um, you know, I was in the studio, I was in the gallery installing and um, uh, this person I work with there said, I think it's so insane that you're doing, like you're mapping out these steel sculptures on Photoshop <laughs> because I was trying to like, design the layout of this one particular wall. And 
I really like to work by myself. Like I have to think, I have to work by myself to hear myself think. And there was all these amazing preparators that were just like, all right, we're ready to move them when you are. <laughs> but I couldn't it, like do it with them because I couldn't focus. Um, and so I had to just map it out by myself on my little screen and then say, okay, these are the measurements. And then we did it um, in real space. But that kind of back and forth to me feels I mean, even the plans for the, the, the show, I mentioned I came down with some ideas. I have a full foam core model of the gallery and I also have one in SketchUp and I went really back and forth between the two um, in, uh, in, in my planning process. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually probably from the same generation as you because I remember when I was like in grad school and um, you know, we were just getting like up to speed, uh, sort of like writing, uh, like like on the laptop and sort of like, but I remember, and I used to make, I used to have to type things like in high school or something, but I remember um, that moment where I could cut and paste and where, I, as you said, the control X, control V kind of like, and I remember thinking how amazing it was to like finally be able to write as fast as I was trying to think, you know, oh, that wow. I could actually try to like construct these complicated you know, arguments and things, but but it was, so it was both a process of slow and fast. And I remember that, how the digital facilitated that. Um, can we go to the next image? I think um, we're gonna be able to start seeing some of this like decision-making uh, sort of both resolved and in action at the same time. Um, so this is another work that is in the exhibition. Erin, um, do you have any thoughts actually, you, you mentioned that the color sometimes, I mean, are from, the scanning and the, um, you know, just take, take in other words, taken and found. But this piece we really intrigued me and we're gonna see some other pieces that are, um, you know, quasi monochromatic, uh, but, but something maybe about color and about black and white versus, or gray tone. And then again, you know, where the images were sourced themselves. Again, this is another layered, you know, metal, Collage or something. Yeah, this this work, this work really fails in reproduction. I'm realizing. <laughs> I think it, I think Jason took an image of it from the side that probably tells the story a little bit better on this one. Um, this really looks flat. I actually also often ask for these works to be photographed with the floor because I think mm. I mean this thing could look this thing could be a postcard. I mean you don't really have a sense of how big it is. We can um, go to the next view. Actually, there might be another if a, in, in the room. Maybe that yeah. was a little bit more. I mean, this one. Yeah. This one. This is the smallest one in the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. I in terms of color, I I think at first when I first started making those particular works, they were monochrome, not necessarily black and white, but sort of you know one tonality. I was working with half tone images, and then um, because I was, I guess I was sort of trying to, I mean, I was just trying to do it, try to get into that process and see what. What's, what was visible. And then, um, you know, I, I think I probably scanned some things and then I rendered them, like turned them into black and white digitally. And I, there was just such a loss in that process. I really felt like there was like a, it felt like it, I was doing the thing, which I was, was, I was draining it of color. I was draining it of some life. And so I was like, you know, let's try to do some of these things in color. And I had never been, I mean, this is like, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of ridiculous how, how 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 much time had passed in my my career as an artist before I'd re really sort of grappled with color <laughs> because everything I, I mean I have made colorful works but it's all been color that has been generated in the process sort of like I've come across it like either cyanotypes or like in the videos that I've made it's the color that's generated through the lighting effects that I've used but um you know to actually say oh I'm gonna use like a red fragment juxtaposed with an orange fragment you know that all felt I felt very uncertain about it for a long time um, and sort of, I don't know, uh, knows my way through it, I guess. But um, I liked claiming or incorporating that very particular tonality that is present in art books of a certain vintage. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, this was, you know, I know there's filters that you can add to your images now to make them look like they're from the 90s or look for, like they're from the 80s. But these like by putting them together, this friend um, suggested like the the frames because they're so deep they function like historical vitrines, but mm -hmm. the, the colors create this confusion about what era it is is being presented. They sort of seem a little bit atemporal. So I don't know. I like I like how the layer of expectation or um, confusion that the color the coloration of these images uh, sort of added to the work. In this case. Um, 
the two images are were black and white um, and the one it's a joel shapiro sculpture actually that is that burned wood on the bottom section um, that's a color image that um, i desaturated a little bit so that it would sort of mesh uh, kind of create a cohesion with the overall um, composition um, but yeah I, I mean this is actually the first uh mono, monotone or monochrome uh work that i've made in this series uh for a while so and I, I, that's so beautiful and it i mean I, I actually would love to go to the next image and maybe ask um you know it's so it's paired with this like tabletop of smaller sculptural pieces um and the conversation between the two of them is so interesting when you were talking about your interest in this moment of like almost like pre-planning as if it were sketches or if it were, was a kind of like before the event, but, the, but that, that, that is the event itself is, is um, you know, these, th this moment of like exploration and like turning and tipping and, you know, kind of like a play, a play, a play but in figuring it out. And yet you did, you did figure it out. Um, I will mention to our, uh, to our audience that, so this is in the, the third, I, I, I'm going to call it both the 3A because um, there's a, a adjacent room. It, it'll be to the to the to, to the right of if, if we were standing here in the image where there is a new video work. So I, so I, I actually put the three of these together. And when I was mentioning that you know you have these like mini uh, like mini retrospectives in each room where, where there's a you know a framed work, a sculptural work, and a, and a video work. But um, okay. Yeah, that, that's how I was kind of thinking about these spaces, how yeah, no, we're nice. both intuitively balancing each experience as, as the visitor walked in and giving us a complete, a complete, um, you know, kind of like encounter with your work. But but let's look at these small sculptures and then we're going to go to some large scale works afterwards. Um, and I, I, will, I will take your guides. We also have some individual views of the pieces themselves. Um, but but uh, I mean, I, and I actually do maybe want to reference um, the tabletop work in the opening gallery, which has such an interesting title that it's called, it's called maquette, which, you know, is typically a, again, a preliminary stage of a larger sculpture or a scale model, but, but, you know, in experiencing it, the experience is it's a complete experience as far as walking around it and the decisions around its balance and the forms and the, and the, um, you know, and, and actually the colors and the multiple views. So, uh, so, would love to hear you talk about, you know, your intentions actually and, and how these fit in with your studio practice. Yeah, um, well, I guess I, 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 I sort of a, a through line in my work is thinking sort of in a self-conscious way about the work of the studio. Um, well, I'll, get, I'll be more, a bit more concrete than that, um, you know, if you're working at scale as a sculptor, like making large works, um, it's very it's rare for you to be working one to one in the in the studio, unless you're someone like Caro, who was like you know there with a whole team of assistants and a and a gantry and a welding torch, and and um, you're oftentimes creating models that are then translated into large large shapes by fabricators or you know um, in shops that have equipment that you don't have. And I, you know, there's a sort of unknowability in that translation. It's sort of a leap of faith that you have to take as an artist when you're making something um, that who's, who's a big part of its impact is gonna be its impression on a body. And you don't really know, you sort of imagine, but you can't really ever know. And there's some, there, that's a corollary to everything I was describing about in terms of looking at things and, and, as an image. Um, so I became interested in, and I like the idea, and there's like sort of like, there's also this influence for me, I've been, uh, have an ongoing interest in um, things that are in a state of limbo, things that are sort of like both coming together and falling apart at the same time, not really being, not, you know, sort of in transition basically. And sort of maquette, um, the, the sculpture that was in the front room, that first gallery next to Sunset, palace that on the pedestal um, is um, from a series of, that's a bronze sculpture, but it is uh, a sand cast, which is a one-to-one -one 
uh, translation of, a, in my case, a foam core object. Mm -hmm. Foam core is just that, you know, paper clad styrofoam um, as really common material. Um, I make uh, models in my studio using that, just like foam core, hand cut foam core with uh, hot glue. And in that case, it was sand cast by the foundry. That's like an impression in sand, the metals poured in. So what you get is this very, in this case, very sort of attenuated, thin curving form that when you see it looks like painted foam core. I mean, the impression of the material is sort of, it's like this uh, exact replica of the material. And, he, and I've said, I've, you know, it was shocking to me when I did this at first because I, you know, I've mentioned this elsewhere, but the, the foam, the hot glue, when you translate it into metal, looks like a weld. So there's a sort of material confusion too when you see it. And foam core, of course, everybody has it. It's a very light, sort of flimsy material. And it has a kind of precariousness to it. Um, but, um, and in that particular work, there is this sort of suggestion of like, is it an architectural model? Is it like a, does it, it looks like kind of, I don't know, from I was making it, I was like, does this look like a sort of weird Williamsburg condo development? Like there's this sort of we like- We could go, we could go three slides down and we'll see it, yeah. So, so uh, let's- uh, It's like very- um, There it is, yeah. 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 And the <laughs> next see, one, the next one I is the Williamsburg on condo. White. I can see that on Weiss, <laughs> I can see that on Bedford. Um, but if you see it in, in, you know, on the underside, it looks very, it looks quite elegant, I'll say from this perspective, but if you see it on the underside, you can see all the hand cut marks and um, it very much is, um, this one's a little bit, uh, I, I suppose, more elegant than the other ones I've made, but they can appear a little bit um, very handmade. I've said, I've said janky before, but they, they feel very sort of like, you know, um a little bit rough uh so maybe i'm getting better at making them because <laughs> this one does look a little bit more finished well let's look at um, the next view of it let's see if we get the inside view yeah so you can see yeah. a little bit of the of the like granulation in the curve which is i wouldn't say it was janky i mean it's yeah. actually it's actually kind of it's suggestive it's suggestive uh, yeah so. well just i mean at the joins you know it's it's i guess it's important to me that it doesn't look machined that it's made by hand um, that it feels like the curve is not a, you know, a digital, like a computer, it's not a CNC curve. It's one that I made, I drew with a pencil. Mm. All of that, um, all of that handmade sort of history with the object is really important for me to retain. And if you go back to the, the table um, installation shot, there's very, two diff very different modes of making the maquettes um, for that, that are on here. They're not all maquettes, but the, the two that are darker are bronzes. Uh, they're made in a slightly different uh, mode. They're, they're casts as well, but they're burnouts. So those are the, the maquette that we just saw is a is an addition to sand cast uh but this these two on the table are unique burnouts which means that the positive is lost in the process of making it so when they pour the metal in the foam core is actually burned away in the process um so these are really sort of all that's left of that um that model um and the other ones though the ones that are silver uh those are welded steel um and they all take all everything on the table takes as its starting point um, these maquettes that I was making in my studio, these models, um, uh, structures that I was making in my studio uh, to photograph. And I was making them based off of looking at forms and books. So I'm sort of circling back to um, mm -hmm. a series of sculptures that I was making expressly to photograph. Um, and there are things that I had saved in my studio in boxes. Um, and I, you know, as objects, I was interested, I sort of kept being interested in them because they're, you know, they're very strange forms. Some of them, they look uh, dimensional through shadow and suggestion of dimensionality, sort of like dusk, dusk form in the main space, um, but are in fact very, very linear, flat things. Um, and they are, you know, they seem to have volumes in ways that they don't if you walk around them. They're very, very much incomplete things. And that was sort of a, a theme in the show that I felt was I was coming up again and again to and something that sort of recurs in my work um, all the time. Fantastic. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so we're only in like, you know, the front room and the back room. Let's let's go to the center room, actually. 
or actually, you know what? I would like to stay. Yeah, let, let's go to the, the very first drop. So sl image number 14. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're still here in the front room. This is the um, piece that Aaron decided to, to uh, put on the right side as you walk in, um, but, it, but it gestures to um, uh, both uh, a previous series and, a, and some, some two new works that are in the next room. But Aaron, do you want to introduce the drop series and we'll look at the other two uh, from, from that, are, that will then will lead us to Dust Swarm actually in the next room. Yeah, I mean, I, I've i said that incompletion is sort of a theme that comes up again and again in my yep. work. Also, you know, uh, you know, I, my my the work that I make feeds into other work. So I'll, I'll, I move between, you know, cyanotypes to collage to, and somehow the work all sort of feeds back into one another. So this series drop, uh, which is, in my usage sort of meant to evoke the terminology of like leftover material in a metal shop, the stuff that's sort of uh, left over, like the negative space of uh, material sort of left on the floor to be discarded. Um, I had been making uh, cyanotypes using these large uh, cardboard, um, I, it doesn't, anyhow, it doesn't matter. I won't go into the whole history, but basically I was making work using um, the sort of leftover scraps that I had in the studio um, that were mostly cardboard and card, but then I had enlarged into steel um, because they were sort of seemed compelling shapes uh, on their own. It's sort of like the shapes that you create when you're not intending to make shapes. Um, they, there was something about them that uh, I decided to allow myself to be interested in. I was like, are these interesting? I'm not sure. I'm going to make them very large in Corten steel. And they were hanging on poles. Um, in these again, sort of informal layered compositions that I guess I picked up again, picked up on again in the draw in the uh, dye sublimation collage works. Anyhow, these um, these particular panels um, here in this iteration of the series are, as you can see, large rectangles. The other, the earlier series was all positive forms, so they were quite asymmetrical. Here it's all rectangles um, because it is uh, in some cases directly, in some cases uh, just a suggestion of the panels that are cut out for the die subs for the collages. Um, so in each of those collages, there's particular shapes that are cut out um, from the die sublimation material. And these rectangles represent the leftover um, uh, shapes, the shapes that are left over once the panels are um, taken out. And they're not, this isn't die sub material, this is Corten steel, but I translated those files into uh, steel and created these very simple compositions with them just laying on top of one another. Um, sort of in a similar um, situation as they are in the frames, just like leaning against the wall in this case. Um, I mean, I think it's incredible incredible, um, Aaron, your description of what was like cast off, but then returned to and then picked up back again, that became a whole other work. And that, and, and I can, I, I mean, I love the evocation of that, that the negative of this, or, or what, what, what was the, what was the positive of another, of another piece became the negative space within this one. And so there's that conversation back and forth between, um, you know, between value, actually, between value and, and when, you know, what constitutes kind of like substance. Um, can we go to the next slide? So we'll see the two. Yeah. So these are um, uh, you can um, you can see sort of like as you come into the gallery, sort of like to the to the right there. But you would be walking in yourself, uh, you know, facing the other direction, and then you can walk around three one eighty and encounter these two uh, again, complex um, and yet uh, eloquent, eloquent and elegant uh, constructions and. As you were talking, um, Aaron, about how you were thinking about they were how they relate to um, the dye sublimation uh, works and the frame pieces, I, I did think of these as like coming out of the frame, as that they were you know kind of like um, leaving leaving that enclosed space and coming to rest and stand almost as figures in some way. Um, but uh, would you like to sort of like um, expand a little bit upon about these slightly more complex um, configurations from the, from the first one we just saw? Um, I mean, they're very, I like that they're just like these factual things mm -hmm. leaning against the wall. I mean, that's the thing that uh, I think I first responded to them. Of course, they're very fun to play around with um, in terms of like what, you know, it's 
what compositions and what arrangements work in my mind the best. Uh, in, these, in this case, I've done something that I've never done before in which I've uh, created two compositions for each work. Um, so not the one in the front, the previous one that we just saw, but these two in particular, uh, they have uh, variations, if you will. <laughs> so this is sort of the expanded variation, but then there's a variation where they're quite, uh, uh, they could be exhibited where they're really sort of densely layered. Um, um, they're sort of smushed together. Have to come up with a better word than smushed, but you know what I mean. So they're more condensed. Um, condensed so, is good. <laughs> yeah, condensed is better. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, uh, you know, this is a sort of relatively new. I don't really have, uh, you know, aside from process, I don't know that I've, I, I guess it, it speaks really explicitly to how circuitous my process and my practice and the show is. Um, I liked that it was very explicitly taking off from the dye sublimation panels. I guess maybe in a way it asserts the thingness of those collages, um, which I think could get lost a little bit in the visual nature of the compositions. You can sort of feel, you know, that the, the impression can be about this imagery instead of it being about these pieces of metals, you know, being layered mm -hmm. in, a, in a frame and seeing this, if you make the connection sort of asserts this sort of like physicality of those of those works. Um, why don't we look at two more, the next view. So this is a view of a, of a different work, work from, that's not in the New York show, um, from the same series to give you a sense of the play that Aaron has been working on. And then obviously this one is the particular kind of like entering into our space of that one little vertical panel that's tilting forward is so interesting. Um, you can also see in this piece in the sort of center, uh, you know, kind of like vertical, the vertical edge of the tallest section, um, the sort of, uh, you know, what happens to, to Corten steel when it's exposed to weather or when it's opposed, what happens, just happens to it as a process of the, um, you know, the, the, the surface actually uh, being exposed. And these marks are things that were so striking to me when I was with the work in person. And if we go to the next image, so here's a detail again of also some of these, like, I, I don't wanna call them scars, but they're, but they're sort of a kind of, um, they're, the, they're, they're the, the, the life of the piece, you know, the life of the piece as it sort of like bears its own marks of, of making and of time. And so um, I just wanted to encourage uh, uh, potential in-person viewers to truly engage in being with these works and I mean and and, and sort of like uh, uh, appreciating them as as um, you know almost a, as somehow alive in some ways. Um, Aaron, do you want to? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I was just going to say I think the image that you showed of those two side by side they look very graphic and just yeah. black. Um, I had oiled them um, before the show, so they had this sort of nice dull sort of gleam to them, but you're right. I mean, it, they will rust, they, uh, you know, try, the humidity in the air over time, steel is alive and they will change. <laughs> all, all of that is things that are things that I, I, I like about the material. The, there was actually even some industrial printing on the surface of the, of the metal, mm -hmm. um, which all of those things, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I guess I'm not a powder coat artist. I'm not gonna uh, cover that stuff up. I mean, uh, there's reasons for that. I'm not, I'm not shaming anybody who powder coats, <laughs> but it's just not something that I'm interested in myself. No, I mean, there's a sort of authenticity that is actually, it feels like a decision that you made, like a decision to leave it and a decision to let it not be. Even like, I mean, I just like it to be this raw material. Yeah. You know? um, I want it to be sort of factual. I guess I'm mm -hmm. sort of that tradition. I like that. Um, all right, we have two bodies of work that are so thrilling and exciting that I want to make sure we have time for Aaron to talk to us about. Could we, um, yeah, so let's let's look at this piece, which we have several views of it. Some of it, um, of the views are from when it was uh, actually in its site of commissioning, which would have been uh, site Santa Fe. Um, so we'll look at a couple of views and have Aaron talk us through the sort of like um, modulation and the pleasure of, of um, making this like monumental work. Um, we're also going to see some views of two works we're not gonna talk so much about, um, you know, that actually do incorporate color. So there's a piece in the back there. And also in the next view, uh, there will be a piece on the side uh, 
um, I know one of them is called an unstoppable. I think this one was actually untitled. So um, this the but, purple one is the purple one is called untitled. Yeah, untitled. Yeah, and then then can we Magdalene, Can we go to the next view? Yeah. So this and this one on the on the right here is uh, you know sort of a French title, um, but. Um, Erin, I mean, tell us tell us a little bit about Dust Crummy. I mean, is this the is this the largest piece you've ever made? Or, or no, or... I was just realizing it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> I know. I had never really thought about it that in those terms, but it is. Um, by probably by a lot. I um I had the opportunity to work with the Public Art Fund a number of years ago on an outdoor work mm -hmm. um, that is very actually quite deeply connected to this piece. Um, but that was quite large. It lived outside. Same material, in that case, painted aluminum and in this case, patinaed and polished aluminum, um, but I think actually both three quarter inch stock. Um, yeah, this piece, uh, you know, it how it changes from the beginning that that view you see when you first come in the gallery, where it looks quite dimensional, but also um, strange in the sense that some of it just falls away into that silvery sort of reflective surface. Um, but it still sort of has a, a heft to it, and some angles make it look like it's receding. Um, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I should have in preparation for this talk come up with something that's like a very sort of snappy sort of encapsulation of my encapsulation of my interest in it, but I don't have it. I just, I really like, there's something in walking around this sculpture um, that mirrors uh, a sense of how those things live in my head and an imaginary space, uh, you know, sculptures that I think had a different life, a different impression on bodies that are of a different era than our own. Um, you know, there is a sort of, there is now when you walk around this sculpture, a collapsing of physical sort of heft into sort of a digital line. Um, the, it just becomes this profile. And well, you can sort of see you can sort of see that here. You know, you can go up to that triangle, and it's very it's this very you know you get the sense of the intensity of that material, the knowledge sort of in your body that if it was to tilt forward and lie on you, that you would no longer be alive. <laughs> it is very sort of scary, intimidating in some ways, but it's also completely thin, and um, the precariousness is, is there, but it sort of doesn't feel real either. Um, so all of those uh, confusions that happen um, uh, between sort of like that are in your body and in the space and in your head and um, as you walk around it are part of uh, what I, I kind of think is my confused relationship to objects um, now that I am someone living in 2024. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, speaking of, of sort of like differences and changeability, um, uh, Magli, could we go to the next image of it? So this is a view of it in Santa Fe. I mean, the the piece is shown in both in interior spaces, but I mean, I, I mean, we're going to look at actually turn to some some video works and some works uh, that were actually have to do with nature itself. Um, but I am wondering if like you thought about how this work, which is, you know, the title's Dusk Form, so a form sort of based on a time of change during the day and the end of day. Um, I'm just curious about it being seen in New York versus it being seen in Santa Fe. I mean, two very, very distinct urban and different environments. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I, I guess I'm, I'm actually trying to open up the conversation and thinking about the world around us as we actually go to um, some of your video works. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. but just to offer I, that up to the to you and to to our to our viewers. Yeah, I mean, I sized the work so that it was twelve inches, twelve inches uh, shy of the ceiling at Site Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. um, a curator that I've worked with in the past called it a ship in the a ship in a bottle. Like mm -hmm. it was very hard to get it in. It you felt that when you're in there, you're like, oh, this feels mm -hmm. out of place. Um, at say at Sigma Jenkins, rather the they have these glorious fifteen foot tall ceilings, so it feels like it's a bit more <laughs> appropriate, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, and as with the previous sculpture that I talked about with the Public Art Fund, I, you know, that particular sculpture was called Sculpture for Snow, and it was up for a year. I liked similar to the fig photographs. I like this notion that what you were watch what you we were looking at was. Um, 
not the thing that you were supposed to be looking at, you know, that there was a sense of incompletion. You weren't actually probably going to see it under snow. In this case, you're not actually going to be seeing it at dusk. Um, so this sort of uh, suggestion of something that wasn't going to be present for you that you had to imagine. Um, I liked that aspect to it. Um, I thought the title could suggest those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I this particular work could be exhibited outside um, and I like the idea of it being seen at that hour. I'm curious what could happen when, you know, the, as I say, like the light changes, the, the horizon changes, everything. Um, so I, I, I don't, you know, we'll see if that happens, but I'll report well, back. <laughs> yeah, and certainly um, for people who get a chance to go see the work in person, um, the work itself changes dramatic, dramatically as you walk around it. I mean, the surfaces, the color, the views. So there actually is no one single, I don't know, uh, place of experience. And, that, and that's what's so incredible about it. Um, but, you know, I, I know we're getting close to the hour and I want to actually have some time to really uh, truly open up where Aaron's practice is. I'm looking at the video, the last piece. So maybe we could um, just like pause a half second on the last, the last couple of images of um, some of her video work. And Aaron, if you want to introduce the idea of how you came to think about adding time to your to your um you know still images and and sculptures um maybe let's just look at the next piece uh next slide actually oh, let's go through these so there's uh this really a, a curious and amazing um installation view of both a projector an old you know uh film projector and the film of a sculpture uh can we go to the next one um also a still of, um, but but I would encourage the viewer to imagine this was, is actually a video piece that's actually happening in time. Um, let's go a little quickly through. So this is, a, again, I mentioned thinking a little bit about um, Aaron's uh, interest in um, in a, a outdoor, outdoor sculpture, let's say, but actually a video of outdoor sculpture. Um, and, I actually would like us to be sort of careful. I mean, let's go back to that that image of Rodent Crater because um, I don't know if we have time to actually talk about, you know, Aaron's conversation with um, with the history of sculpture, especially the history of abstract sculpture. But I do want to encourage viewers to think about it vis-a-vis -vis, um, the cutouts, uh, the, the the drop works, and um, these earthworks, I think, are an anime earthwork documents of earthwork, or art, artwork documenting earthworks. <laughs> even even the language to describe it is, you know, it's so um, tenuous. Fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Aaron, maybe um, making a connection then to your interest in, I mean, and these and this is actually so this is uh, work from almost ten years ago, over ten years ago, and um, I do I would love to sort of like look at the uh, the video works, um, you know, which range in duration from like. Uh, 15 minutes to about half an hour. That's kind of like the time period you ask of the viewer to sit with it in setting up, looking at the newest video. Um, if there's, so, so, so we have, we, I wanted to start talk a little bit about Rodent Crater. Uh, Magley, we can go to the next one. Um, this is a really compelling, uh, again, slow video piece of um, images that Aaron took of the UN building. So, Aaron, as I understand, you you took over a hundred photographs of the UN building, and then I, created I, a video. honestly, I don't. I haven't reminded <laughs> myself of it, but yeah, I used to live in Greenpoint, and I would ride my bike over to the Seven Train and Long Island City over the Pulaski Bridge all the time. And you get this sort of you get a little south, southern from this view of the UN building. Um, this video, like Roden Crater, was assembled in the same way. Uh, I took original images of both, in the Rodent Crater case, I, I took an image off the internet and then printed out a physical copy of, uh, of these photographs, put them in my studio and reshot those photographs using various sort of analog light uh, setups and generated a whole bunch of secondary images that then became sort of a stop motion animation in a way, very simple um, animation of crossfades from one still to the next. So- go to the next um, image as an, as an example, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the next one. Yeah. And this one. Yeah. Yeah. So in this particular piece, uh, the I feel 
actually it's still really operative to me when I when I see it, even though I made it like this, these two registers of time happening at once, because you sort of get sucked into the sense that time is changing within the image as if you're watching, you know, dawn breaking over Midtown. Um, but then also you get a sense of sort of the artificial time in the video passing simultaneously. There's like a s smoke rising from, you know, a building where it's frozen, even though dawn is sort of seemingly rising over the, the skyline. So it's a very sort of disorienting sense of uh, time. And I, you know, I have always been interested in creating scenarios in which a viewer is compelled to spend time with a work. Um, none of my videos are ever narrative. So it's not like you're following along a story, but that you're caught in a web of looking. Um, and there's no real specific, like as I've said before, there's no specific aim. It's a, I just call it like an open-ended encounter. You know, this sort of, there's a, for me, a, a value in staying with something and, uh, and feeling your body just you know just to stay with stay with something and let it unfold wherever it goes um so that uh video this video is 17 minutes um you're not intended to stay with it for the 17 minutes there's it's a seamless loop they're all seamless loops so they sort of function like a painting or a sculpture in a sense that you can spend as much time with it as you want, um, that there's no sort of, if you see it at a, at a different point, you might see something different, but whatever's in it then is hopefully in it before, you know, it's all of a piece. So um, yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, regardless, <laughs> actually my mother-in-law went to see uh, that 39 minute long video. She said, I watched the whole thing and I was just like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're well, very you're a very kind supportive mother-in-law but it's not the intention <laughs> i felt um, bad for her actually well i i mean i, I think I, I do want to encourage anyone who has a chance to actually sit with this piece in particular um it, it's not as long as the 39 it's not pieces. up <laughs> it's not up it's not uh, it's is, not this, up it's not up we're yeah. going to see another another 16 minute piece that actually is also equally compelling but this work in particular to anyone who has either either spent time in New York or has any, um, you know, um, uh, thinks about like, you know, the UN, you know, in particular, and then how this image of the building acts as both a sort of like screen surface, but then because of the time that Aaron gives us, it, it actually allows you to start thinking about your own memories and your own thinking about, you know, um, you know, governmentality and of like monoliths and monuments. And so there, there's, there's something that's very generous about, about this piece. And I think the time has a lot to do with it. Obviously the image itself has a lot to do with it as well. But then as you spend time in, with it, the details become so interesting because it's not a straight shoot, you know, because it, it, you, you, you are able to see that like, oh, that car never moved or that car did move or, or like, why, how did it, how did it not move? And then, and you get a sense of like that the, it's all in the winter time or something. I mean, it's a, it's, it's not, and even though it refers to, it could be a whole year. So mm. the, these plays with time are, and these little glitches or little decisions are, um, they just, they, they, there's so much capacity in actually spending time, you know, with, with a really powerful uh, composed video, uh, you know, mm. time-based work. Um, so, so, uh, Maggie, do we have a still of the the video piece that's at Sukhumar Jenkins? So, so this is a still of a new video. Um, I I'm, I'm tempted to let it run while Aaron talks about it, and then open it up for questions. I don't know if we can do all of that together. Um, is that? Am I supposed we, to be looking at the chat? I don't know. I see chat. I, I, I well, we're, we're, I think we're going to open it back up to our moderators to deal with questions. But um, okay. Magli, what do you think? And Chloe, can we run a little bit of the video and give people a sense of what is happening and then have Aaron talk about it, but then also let the video run while we do questions? I'm, I'm not sure how Zoom might allow us to do that. Uh, yes, I think we should be able to because the, er, the video itself isn't too loud. So y'all will be able to talk over it. So All I can right. start sharing it. Okay, cool. How's that sound? Yeah, Aaron. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Let's 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 watch it, and I want to encourage everyone to really watch it. <laughs> mm. 
we'll let Magli do her magic a little bit. I can't believe it's already a little bit after the hour. Um, oh my God. Yeah, I, did, I did, hadn't see, looked at my clock. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. Um, I, well, maybe I'll just say a little bit about it um, before, oh yeah, here we go. Full screen that. Um, here we go. So this is a, um, this is just found footage uh, uh, that I got off uh, YouTube. Um, and it's a 60 minute loop. We're not gonna watch the whole thing. So I'll describe what happens in it. Um, this artist is making a large uh, ceramic pot and he's going through the process of forming the clay. Many of you are probably, uh, or you know how to do this. Um, anyhow, it's just like sort of the process and he had crossfades involved in his video and then I added some crossfades myself. And I made these very basic uh, interventions in the video so, so that the, the activity is in a is in an unending loop. Um, so he forms uh, the vase and then it sort of reverses at some point here it's reversing. Um, again, sort of seamlessly, but uh, you know if we were listening to the audio full full steam, you wouldn't get a sense the audio is in reverse because it's in fact in forward. So it just feels like it's sort of like uh, all sort of progressing forward. but in fact the time is being manipulated back and forth. Um, he gets to the point of uh, creating a sort of a, a vase-like form that's quite large. It goes off the screen. There's so much clay it goes up off the frame for a while, but then it becomes this sort of a vase, but then it quickly starts devolving back into a lump of clay. And so it's sort of this cycle of making and unmaking that just progresses uh, sort of unending, unendingly. <laughs> and it's called prototype. Prototype is something, the idea of the prototype, the status of the prototype is something that I've always been interested in or for the last several years, you know, something that happens within a studio environment, something that happens through play and experimentation, but then doesn't really have the status of a final object. It's sort of a test case. It's like a maquette in a way, but then what do you do with this prototype afterwards? It's sort of like better than the original, but it's not quite itself either. It's just an interesting sort of orphan status that um, I'm kind of curious about um, in terms of objects. So um, yeah, that's this. There's some moments in the video where the audio reverse is quite, um, is meant to be noticed. Um, he, he washes his hands once and the audio is reversed and it sounds satanic. I mean, just like a reverse record, you know? So there's some sort of, and it, this is shot on my computer uh, I, with my you know 4K camera shooting on uh, off my monitor. So that you see the sort of netted uh, surface of my uh, computer monitor. It has, I think, kind of an ominous uh, vibe to it. Um, and the, the audio is just the rhythmic sound of the wheel turning, 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 turning. He grunts every now and then, but I've cut out um, any, mo any, um, any view of his face. So he just remains sort of this, it's just his hands. Um, yeah, this is a new work. So that's all um, you're going to get. <laughs> I don't know. What to... It felt well, like I just, I just, so much of so I'll just say that like there's so much in the show that's like clean and precise, even though I made it all by hand it's like it's it's so clean and I liked how messy and tactile this was, even though you know it's a video of a sculpture, um, which is like the sort of uh, you know layering of uh, mediation that's I, I guess. I don't know, I constantly feel is my safe space, I guess, but it's just uh, it just felt like a, it, it, it was the dirt that this that the show needed, I guess. Well, it's also super exciting if, um, as you said, it's a direction that your work might go in. I mean, thinking about, as you say, the never endingness, the incompleteness, that it's also ceramic, you know, it's kind of uh, interesting to me as a as a material that you're exploring, um, but uh, but I, I think it's a it was a beautiful way to actually end the show and open it up, open it to you know possibilities. Um, I, I I'm going to project a little bit of my own, you know, uh, thinking about your work and you know just propose to the audience that your work has this also very quiet dialogue 
you know, to um, the history of sculpture and 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 feminist possibilities. I, I actually do think there's a uh, like an alternative being proposed here as to how we might think of abstraction and power and um, you know uh, hierarchies. Uh, and and I, I do think time has something to do with it. Um, but I think it's actually probably time for us to hear from the audience and see. Um, you know, what what has been on your minds. And thank you for being patient with us for this last hour. You can sort of see now how, how, how the vase, you know, might be, but we're, we're only like a third of the way through the video. So um, again, this is a, a work that really rewards uh, sticking with it. Um, if you get a chance to to go see it in the gallery and, you know, maybe maybe another space will pick it up somewhere to, uh, to see um, in person. But Maggie, how, how do you want to, yeah, how do we manage the questions? Great. <laughs> we're, we're all back together again. Well, first, I want to thank you both for such an insightful conversation. I was tuned in the entire time. Um, we do have a few questions. The uh, first is from GE. And GE, you can go and unmute yourself and ask the question. Oh, GE, you're still on mute. I'm sorry. Nope, there we are. I there we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Magley. And thank you, Aaron, especially. Um, when I look at your work, I see the power of uncertainty. Uh, and it seems to be calling attention to the things we don't think about when we look at images and forms and the way they challenge our assumptions and the ones especially that we, we're making all the time in our general stream of consciousness. Um, is there anything to this? Oh, I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of go through my entire life feeling uncertain. I don't know that I, <laughs> I don't know anytime I feel certain, I guess I feel certain about uncertainty. Um, yeah, I, I think of my work, I guess, as proposals. Um, I don't think about, uh, what, I, you know, anytime I come, I, I'm asked to do a situation like, asked to a presentation like this, um, never, I will say, never as close to mounting a show as this particular situation is. <laughs> so I'm particularly incoherent probably today, but anytime I feel like I'm called to sort of like explain myself, I, you know, I, I think I come across as like too sensical sometimes, because in reality, I'm in the studio a lot, sort of, hopefully allowing myself to do, to move from one thing to the next, almost with blinkers on, you know? And so I, you know, and it's only being attendant to the work until it gets to a certain sort of, like I've said before, integrity, it has some sort of thing to say, um, or I don't even know if that's not even the right language to use, but it has its own sort of thing going on that I can stop and put it out there. But I, I, I do really closely uh, subscribe to that sort of way of thinking about things. You know, the, the, the ceramic video, if I could say a little bit more about it, I love, you know, something about it is like, um, I, I mean, I like that it has that eternal form, you know, that, that there's people have been making that form for time immemorial, you know? So that particular video alludes to like, I mean, I don't know about you, I feel like that looks like it was made in the 1920s, you know, but it was actually the 1990s, that video. But it has a sort of timelessness to it um, that I like. Uh, you know, so when I when I see that footage, I just think, ah, there's something there, but I don't know. I'm uncertain about what exactly it is, but it feels resonant to me. And um, so if I start to work with it. But you know, the other aspect of that work that I like or that video, the footage that was resonant to me is that you're forming it, but there's some, there's moments in the video where it feels like it's making itself and that gets into the woo woo studio. Um, but I am also a big believer in that, you know, you make the work, it makes you, there's this dialogue that happens very in a private space in the studio. Um, and I think you have to be uncertain in order for that to happen you have to be able to be open to that process. That's like, I say those things and I believe them, but I know it, maybe it sounds old fashioned, maybe it sounds all of, I don't know. But I, I mean, I, I think that's the magic and the privilege and the loveliness about being able to be an artist. Anyhow, thank you for your, <laughs> thank you for that comment. Thank you. 
Thank you, GE. The next question is from Timothy, which I will ask. Um, the question is, you mentioned Brancusi. Who, who else's work inspires you and any architects? Oh, God. I mean, all of the, all of the regular, all of the typical subjects, uh, all of the regular expected people probably for architects. Um, you know, Carol is someone that I use again and again and again because his work is so material rich, but also formally graphic, especially in, in photographs. Um, I, you know, I like his work because it's so I he's someone whose work I use in those collages a lot, but he's sort of an artist that I admire. I admire any artist that has like, I mean, listen, like the foundry that I use upstate is next to Frank Stella's studio. And I'm not a, a you know, Frank Stella's practice wasn't something that kept me up at night, but he was making work up into the very end and making crazy work. I mean, like it just, you know, he had his moment, but then he just kept going and going and producing and producing a prove like a, a sort of a strange offshoot or an unexpected offshoot of really using art history as a material is that you get I've become acquainted with the biographies and the output of so many artists that we don't even think about anymore because you come I come across their images in remaindered books from the strand and I'm like who's this person and then I'll you know get some more books by them and you know all of the people who are famous for like five works you you're like oh well what were they doing before what were they doing after what are they really saying it sort of puts the lie to art history and all the stories and all the narratives that sort of neatly encapsulate the, you know this output that's gone on forever it's people are weirdos like everybody <laughs> people are really strange idiosyncratic makers and i have been able to come in contact with artists that were never on any syllabus uh, in all of the art school that I went to in my life. Uh, so um, I don't know. Right now, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> right, thank you. And then we have one last question from Chloe. Hi, Erin and Christina. This has been so lovely to listen to. Thank you both so much. Erin, I'm just curious how you think about the frames for many of your works and if the frame sort of becomes part of how you make room for accident within the composition or how the frame operates as a device to make way for this un um the word you used was uh like unforeseen, you know, like just the the circumstances of working in the studio. I think the thing that um you know, when I was first, I, I studied, I wasn't, I didn't study photography um, in school. And I kind of became, you know, once I registered that images were so central to my practice, I was trying to understand why that was. And I came back to, I kept on coming back to the physical properties, sort of the sculptural properties of images. Um, and, you know, that, that they're so flat, that they're so still that they are like at a remove from you. Um, the frame is something that really ex exacerbates the la the latter. You know, it's like it sort of establishes, formalizes the remove, right? And so that space that it creates between you and it, its own little world within the frame, and you and your own little world. I like that uh, psychological sort of dynamic at play there. Um, in the, my case, because I deal with stuff that has an art historical lineage oftentimes or an uh, allusion to art history, I think it it functions a bit like a vitrine sometimes, as I mentioned before, like it has sort of a, a display strategy, you know, like, oh, you're looking at a historical book or, oh, you're looking at this sort of specimen from a different time. So those are things that other people have told me and I, I see in it for sure. Um, aside from the practical necessity, um, uh, oftentimes just to like create a stable environment for these things that are a little bit tenuous, maybe. Um, but, you know, I suppose in terms of sculpture, the pedestal kind of functions traditionally is thought of in the same way as a as a frame. And in this case, it, again, it's sort of it's proposing something that where the scale is not with you on the ground that it's something that is physical with you but is also sort of alive as an image in your head and i like that duality um, in terms of objects so 
um, I guess that's how I think about it. Um, does Thanks, that answer Karen. that? Yeah, <laughs> that's an amazing answer. Thank you so much. Um, back over to you, Magley. Thank you, Aaron and Chloe. Uh, we have one last question from Fong, and he will unmute and ask the question himself. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, hi, Fong. <laughs> hi, Aaron. Congratulations. <laughs> hi, hi. Uh, I was in and out, Christina, so forgive me. I got disrupted by too many phone calls as I'm walking now to a, a meeting. <laughs> but uh, but I love modern technology. I get to ask my question. Um, yes, I, I admire the work and I was thinking in reference to Taplin when he came to Paris for the first time to visit Picasso's studio, 1913, he was admittedly smitten, profoundly moved by the first cutout, the guitar. There's few versions of one of them, of course, at MoMA that he gave to Bill Rubin. But because of that encounter, that literally a few years later launched constructivist movement in Russia. And I was thinking about how it relate the relationship, particularly not all the artists, but for example, Rochenko is one, you know, and Anton Pastner, the other, who were trying to achieve that pictorial synthesis between collage aesthetic, what was considered to be photography, uh, and sculpture. So I was wondering whether such similar encounter or epiphany when early on in your early formation that you similarly experience? I, you know, I, I can't, I honestly, I, I, it would go into some sort of strange pseudo biography, psychology, pseudo psychology. I don't really know. All I know is that when I was an undergrad, this first sculptures I made, um, really were i was really fascinated by those little weird uh cardboard structures that look like constructive constructivist uh sculptures and or abstract sculptures the things that are created in like throwaway picture frames the struts mm. uh -huh. that you see on the back of a, a photo that you fold out and fold down so it stays upright at an angle yeah. i i was sort of obsessed with those forms because they had a utility but they were really mm -hmm. sort of stripped down. They're minimal. They're very uh, perfunctory and sort of like not precious. And yeah. I, I made those objects quite large. I made them in different material, but I photographed them on, ah. on landscapes and they sort of came alive. They had a richness. They had a, they sort of the photograph imbued them with this life, with this suggestion yeah. of like history or something that the actual objects didn't. And there was some sort of lesson in that that I absorbed yeah. fully. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it didn't come through studying art history. It was really sort of through experimentation in my own studio. But those are artists that I admire. Those are artists whose work I use in my collages. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, it's, that's an interesting uh, touch point for sure. No, but I was thinking in the context also, if you were saying that it was undergrad so would it been at the time you were taking you remember i don't think they do it anymore but we were uh, asked requested required to take two-dimensional design and three-dimensional design uh, and my question is that when you took when you took those photographs were they in black and white or were they in color Oh God, they were in color with an Instamatic camera. I mean, I didn't, <laughs> okay. have a very, I didn't have a very rigorous undergrad education in terms of design at all. It was a very sort of loosey goosey visual arts program, but I, um, you know, it was back before, well before everybody carried a photo, uh, a camera in their iPhone. Um, you know, it was one of those Instamatics where you would take them to the drugstore and I'm, oh, really, yeah. I'm really dating myself, but you would wait two weeks to see what you got. Um, and okay. it was invariably all bad. Um, so that that was sort of the level that I was at. I wasn't in the dark room or anything. Um, it was really, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a way, thinking about the photograph, those photographs were so inherently unprecious. They were just yeah, yeah. toss in a shoebox. 
Um, but then they became physical. They became this document. Um, yeah. That aspect, that objecthood that they immediately had, that also really made an impression, I think, um, in terms of shaping my interests in materials and moving forward. Yeah. Well, that's, that's quite re revelatory. Thank you so much. I'm going to see the show now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> back, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so and much, Fong. <laughs> it does. It does actually does open up a whole line of um, thinking and questioning, Aaron, about you know teaching and learning and you know advice to young artists and and how to trust yourself or um, you know allowing for mistakes to happen and and letting letting that go. But I think um, that might be for another another talk with another another show sometime. Christina, you and I will go on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could. You just, you let me know. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Christina, you've been such an amazing uh, person to do this with. Thank you. You've taken it so seriously and I really appreciate all your time. Oh, Aaron, it was a pleasure. It was really, I mean, really what, a, what, what, Thank you. what a perfect time to do it with you. I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah well, really. I appreciate, your, I appreciate all your patience as I <laughs> sort through what I did last week in that gallery. So thank you all. You did good. You did good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much, Aaron and Christina, and thank you to Meg and Monica from Sakema Jenkins and Co. for their support in preparing for today's event. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible, and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 24 years. A donation directly supports our writers, production staff, and operations. Support our work through the link in the chat. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Alice Sensamore, James Hoff, and Jenny Waldo on the event of the re recent release of Fluxus newspaper. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Thank, you Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.